We're talking a little NBA draft and Big East offseason storylines with NBCSports.com writer Rob Doster. Rob just put out Mock Draft 5.0 on NBCSports.com. You can catch it there. And Rob, you have a Big East player in the first round getting selected. Of course, there's other mocks to be made, but who is that Big East player and what makes him a first rounder? Well, it's Eric Pascal from uh, Villanova, and you know the consensus on him seems to be a little bit lower than where I am. I just think he's one of these guys that fits in terms of what you want out of an NBA player these days. You know, he's crazy athletic. We all saw that. He's six foot six. He has a wingspan. He's able to make threes. He can guard up if you need him to. He can guard down. Uh, he played in a system at Villanova that just churns out NBA role plays. I mean, Josh Hart, Ryan Archdiak, and you know, all of these guys end up lasting in the NBA a little bit longer than maybe uh, people expected. And I think that has to do with the way that Jay Wright coaches and teaches and develops players within his program. Uh, I haven't gone to the Spurs. That just seems like a perfect fit to me, going from Jay Wright to Greg Popovich. Uh, the Spurs seem to always find a way to make players that kind of last in college work in the NBA, whether it's like a Derek White or, um, or, or I'm blanking on the name of the guy from Michigan State. Uh, that that's playing there now, but they they it just works when you go to the Spurs if you're a guy that knows how to play. And Eric Pascal, when you play for Jay Wright, you have to know how to play, and I think Eric Pascal does. Bryn Forbes, that's the name. There you go. Of course, as soon as I'm done, I come up with it. There you go, Bryn Forbes. For Villanova, we saw last year the four draftees after winning a national championship, perfect situation for the Wildcats and. We're seeing Jay Wright's recruiting class. It's top five in the country heading into this upcoming season. Perhaps Pascal is a testament to this. How much is Jay Wright building something that can not only be successful in college, but can be something that NBA teams love? I mean, I think it already is. You know, I think the way that he's able to uh, turn players um, into just full basketball players, like the thing about guys – at Villanova, it's not like they are uh, built to be, you know, just a point guard. You're not going there just to be a two guard. You're not learning how to uh, run off of this screen, and that's the only shot that you're going to be able to make. You're not learning how to only, you know, run uh, one kind of post up or one um, one certain kind of play. He teaches you to be a basketball player. They only have like four or five set plays that they call, and. I think that that's what you need to be at the NBA level. You know, you can't just be a guy that can do one thing, two things, three things, whatever, really well. If you want to last in the NBA, you have to be able to do a lot of different things. Versatility is the name of the game now. You know, we used to call them tweeners. Now tweeners are what you look for. You want those combo forwards. You want those combo guards. And I think the way that Jay runs his program, it, it develops players to be in those roles. And the other part of it is that you know, there's only a certain number of guys that are going to be stars in the NBA. You know, everybody can't be Kevin Durant. Everybody can't be Steph Curry. There just aren't that many players that are good enough to be those guys. And I think that what Villanova players learn, and, and it's, all, it's part of what Jay Wright recruits to, you know, it's something that he looks for in his guys that he brings into his program, is the ability to accept a role, the ability to maybe spend a year e either redshirting or not playing the minutes that you end up wanting to play. And I think that mindset actually helps them when they go to the NBA. Because, you know, Jalen Brunson, he was the national player of the year in 2018. You go to the NBA, you're coming off the bench. You're going to be a role player. He he's probably going to be a career backup point guard. And he has the mindset where he can accept that, play a role. And he's, I, I think he's going to end up spending 10, 12, 14 years in the NBA. Bit of a different case for Jay Wright, but there hasn't been anything that he can't handle. And when you win two national championships in three years, it only means that you're going to get more of a luxury of getting those types of players. The revelation, though, is that you do have Villanova in your preseason top five while it is still so early. Who's the biggest threat to the Wildcats in the Big East? I would say it's probably Seton Hall if Miles Powell comes back, assuming that he does come back to school. You know, they basically bring back everything from last season. And, and you know, last year they were uh, one of the more dangerous teams. Um, I do think that it all depends on Miles Powell. That's not really, you know, I'm not breaking news here. He, he's probably going to end up being one of uh, the most dangerous scorers in all of college basketball. Uh, but with uh, with the Hauser brothers gone, I just, I don't know if I can fully trust Marquette at this point. If they were back, you know, I had Marquette three nationally, third with the Hauser brothers back. But without them, 
you know, I, I just need to see, you know, guys like Brendan Bailey prove it to me. And and I got to see how, you know, Kobe McEwen adjusts the life in the Big East versus life uh, playing at Utah State. So for me, I think that is probably Seton Hall. That said, you know, it's going to be really, really good at the top of the Big East this season. I got five or I have four without Marquette. I have four Big East teams in the preseason top 25, along with uh, Creighton and Xavier, who both I think could end up uh, challenging, you know, Seton Hall and, and Villanova at the top of the league. Let's get back to NBA draft storylines for a moment. Shamari Pons invited to the NBA draft combine, which is going on this week. What about Shamari's game could make him valuable for a team in the second round? Uh, he's just such a dynamic scorer and a dynamic playmaker, and he can operate in ball screens. He can create in isolation. And, you know, at the end of the day, teams are looking for that. You have to be able to do something at an NBA level to get picked in the second round. And Shamori Pons can score and create an NBA level. The thing that makes me uh, a little bit bullish on him is in terms of a prospect is the fact that he was much more of a creator this past season uh, than he was two years ago. You know, I think his efficiency was up. He shot the ball better because he didn't try to force as much. Uh, I think one of the things that was really promising about him is that he kind of let the game come to him a little bit. You know, there were times where uh, he would let other guys go out and create in the first half. And then when St. John's was down or they needed the run, he would try to take over in the second half. He made a lot of big shots throughout the year. There were games where St. John's probably shouldn't have been as close as they were at the end. But Pons did make the plays down the stretch a lot of games, especially early in the season uh, when St. John's needed him to. I think he's got a chance to hang around for a little while as a backup point guard. I don't think he ends up being a starter. I don't think he ends up being an all-star or anything like that. But I think if you can get him in the second round, get him on your second team, and let him go at other NBA second teams, I think that he is talented enough uh, to be able to find a way. I think there's a job for him in the NBA. Let's put it like that. There's a job for Shamari Pond somewhere in the NBA. That's Rob Doster from NBC Sports. One of the teams, you talk about top 25 down the road for St. John's maybe, but one of those teams that's in your top 25 heading into next season, you brought them up, it's Xavier. Najee Marshall tested the waters. He is coming back for his junior season. And Travis Steele, we knew he had a recruiting pedigree, Rob. Xavier's been a staple to the NCAA tournament. What makes you think they're back in there next season? They have all their guys back. And, and you know, they played really, really well down the stretch of last season. It, it was a little bit of, uh, I think Travis Steele had some growing pains at the start of the season moving into that head coaching position. Uh, but when you get everybody back, especially Najee Marshall, and you just look at the track record that Xavier coaches have had when they promoted from within, whether, you know, Sean Miller, Thad Mata, uh, Chris Mack, Skip Prosser, all of these guys, like, Xavier just finds ways to get coaches that are good at what they do. And there's no reason for me to believe that Travis Steele is anything other than that, especially with the way that Xavier finished last season. Now, the, the big thing when it comes to college basketball success for me is roster continuity. And they're getting all of these pieces back. Some of them are really, really good players, all Big East caliber players. And I just I trust that that Travis Steele is going to find a way to get it done with guys on his roster. And look. They weren't great last year, but most of the pieces that he has are four-star recruits. Those are guys that are top 100 players for a reason. Now they're going to be veterans. They've been with Travis for a, a season as the head coach. I just think he's going to find a way to get it done. In a lot of respects, Steele brought up the fact that this 2019-20 season really started last year at the end of last season when they won seven of their final 10 games, went to the NIT, and there were building blocks being placed for What's ahead for the Xavier Musketeers? You also have Creighton in your early top 25. Why? I think they're going to be a lot of fun to watch next year. Again, another Always. team that brings back a lot of talent, a lot of guards. I think that this is the year that Tyshawn Alexander and Mitchell Ballack end up making that leap to being guys that are kind of all Big East caliber players. I'm kind of betting on that. I think Marcus Zagorowski is going to end up being a guy that, I don't know if you could put him on a breakout player list because I still think he's probably their third option, but I do think he's going to be one of these guys where at the end of the year you're saying, okay, he's a lot better this year than I realized he was. Uh, I just, uh, you know, I trust Greg McDermott to be able to find a way to get talent to score, to score a lot of points. I don't know if they're ever going to get a stop, but at some point, if you're scoring like 80, 90, 100 points every single night, if you're making 10, 12, 15 threes a night, you're going to win a lot of basketball games. It's a good story. Talking to Greg McDermott last season, they hosted Gonzaga, and the Zags were off to a fantastic start, had beaten Duke. And Greg McDermott says in his pregame press conference, he's like, 
For me, it's my assistant's job to find a way to hold them to 99, and it's my job to score 100. I mean, that's exactly the way that they run their program, and it's the way they've been doing it. The funny thing about that is, I don't know if you remember him from his Northern Iowa days, but that is not what he did at all. You know, back in the day when he had those good teams, he, they were running possession by possession. They were running a lot of uh, set plays, a lot of offense. They were draining the shot clock. They were really, really good defensively, and that's not what they are now. It's, you know, it's it's... It's like when he had his son and he realized how good his son was and he had guys like Ethan Raggy and he had guys like Grant Gibbs. He just decided, look, you know what? Uh, this is what I have. This is how we need to play. I'm going to make it effective. And all of a sudden, boom, it's fun. You recruit a guy like Mo Watson. All of a sudden you have another All-American. You have another top 10 caliber team. And, you know, I think he kind of got addicted to the scoring. So I don't blame him. It's more uh, – let me put it like this. It's more fun to watch you play this way, Greg, than it was to watch you play when you're at Northern Iowa. So don't change. It's so fun that Rob Doster has a Doug McDermott bobblehead right in his yeah. right in his room. It it never leaves you, Rob. That Dougie McBucket's jumper. I I hear you've tried it out a couple times. Yeah, you know I, I was the one guy that could shoot better than Doug McDermott. So uh, I think Greg, when he was recruiting, um, he he kind of missed out on the opportunity to have a guy like me on his team. He hasn't found that Mount Laurel, New Jersey footprint quite yet. He has not. He has not. He needs to. He needs to expand his. Uh, his geographic range when it comes to recruiting. We did everything but give out Rob's address. Rob Doster, <laughs> NBCSports.com. Check out his mock draft, and he's got college basketball covered there throughout the year. Rob, thanks. Thanks, John.